Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the hormone leptin. We'll look at its production, and then we'll look at its biosignaling via the leptin receptor, also called LEPR, and we're also going to discuss some of the important biological effects of leptin and implications of it in health and disease. So first of all, what is leptin? So leptin is a peptide hormone that is released by fat cells. So this is adipose tissue right here in this picture, and the individual cells are called adipocytes. And these cells are going to secrete leptin, okay? They're going to secrete it into the blood, and leptin is going to travel to various cell types and induce certain biological effects, okay? Um, one of the important biological effects that leptin has is to repress hunger. And usually if you hear leptin discussed in any course, that's the typical uh, function that you're going to hear about, is that it represses hunger. Um, and we'll talk about how that occurs on the next slide. Some other things that leptin actually does that we don't normally talk about but are also still very important is leptin is actually going to stimulate the degree of metabolism. In particular, it's going to increase the rate of fat breakdown, uh, mainly by uh, inducing beta oxidation of fatty acids. Okay? Um, now, here's a good diagram that really explains leptin's functions. So here's leptin being released by this adipocyte into the blood. Now, what leptin can do first of all, is it inhibits fat synthesis. Okay, so we're talking about mainly triglyceride synthesis. So when you eat um, a lot of food, okay, a very high calorically dense food, um, the fat itself can be turned back into fat. Um, but remember that glucose, especially excess sugar in the diet, can also be converted into fatty acids, which are then stored as triglycerides in adipose tissue. Okay? And so leptin is going to inhibit this process of fat synthesis. Okay? Also, leptin is going to stimulate fat degradation through beta oxidation. Okay? So these two effects right here um, really amplify one major thing. And that is to decrease the amount of triglycerides in adipose tissue. Because remember, the more triglycerides you have in the adipose tissue, the bigger the adipose tissue becomes, and that's what contributes to obesity, since the more fat you have, the more obese you are. Okay? And so by decreasing the degree of fat synthesis, less fat is stored in the adipose cells, and concurrently, by stimulating beta oxidation, you have more of that fat degradation. Okay? And there's also some other stuff we'll look at in terms of its, uh, how it actually um, gets rid of that fat two slides from now. <clears throat> One other thing I want to mention that we'll come back to on the next slide that's also very important is adipose cells can vary in size. Generally speaking, uh, again, it can vary a little bit from this, but in general, the amount of fat cells you're born with is the amount of fat cells you have now. That can change a little bit, but in general, fat cells really don't divide. Instead, they grow in size. Okay, so if you see somebody on, let's say, the show My 600 Pound Life, who is 600 pounds, very, very morbidly obese, those people don't necessarily have a lot more fat cells than a smaller person. Rather, their fat cells have just expanded because they're containing a lot more triglycerides, which is the storage form of fat. Okay, and so if you have a cell, an adipose cell, that is, that has more fat, it's going to release more leptin. And we should think about why that makes sense. If leptin's job is to decrease fat synthesis and stimulate fat breakdown, then it makes sense that a person who has more fat tissue should make more leptin because it's the body's response to trying to get that fat to be burned, right? To get rid of that fat and prevent more from being stored. So if you have less adipose tissue, so smaller fat cells, they're going to release less leptin, okay? And leptin's going to function via this uh, JAK-STAT pathway. And this receptor, it's a, a homodimer. This is actually the uh, leptin receptor. So here's leptin in the blood. It's coming over here. And it's going to bind to the leptin receptor in the plasma membrane. Um, this is very similar in concept to the receptor tyrosine kinases, where these two receptor monomers are going to have to dimerize in the presence of leptin, as you see right here. And there's going to be associated proteins called JAKs. Um, JAK stands for Janus kinase. And basically what these um, proteins are going to do is they're going to phosphorylate target proteins. Um, it will actually phosphorylate the receptor itself, as you see right here. There's been a couple phosphates added here. And that allows this protein, which is actually in the cytosol, called STAT, 
to localize to the leptin receptor, but it only localizes to the leptin receptor once it's been phosphorylated by this Janus kinase. And now you see the stat is kind of sticking here. Okay, now the stat itself um, can also be phosphorylated. Um, so you see here that the Janus kinase can also phosphorylate this stat. You see here, here's a phosphate attached. If you have two phosphorylated stat proteins, they can actually dimerize. And they will dimerize and move into the nucleus where they'll bind to a target gene and they will upregulate that target gene. So you get the mRNA and the protein and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, generally speaking, uh, leptin signaling via the LEPR or leptin receptor is going to upregulate genes that are neuropeptides. Okay. And some of these genes, at least, at least in the brain, would act to decrease hunger, so increase satiety. Okay. And we'll talk about that on this slide. So here's just an analogy so you can understand it better, that the more fat volume that you have, the bigger your fat cells are, the more leptin that's going to re be released. So a smaller individual who has, relatively speaking, a lot smaller fat cells, so less fat stored, they're going to release a small amount of leptin. Now remember, leptin's a peptide. This is actually its ribbon diagram. Um, they're going to release a lower amount of leptin. A larger individual who has a lot more fat volume, so maybe considered obese, they theoretically should be making a larger amount of leptin. Okay, And in general, the amount of leptin that's released by the adipocytes, remember, is going to be proportional to the size of the fat cell. Okay, So this guy over here on the far right has a lot more fat volume than the guy on the left. So he's going to be making a lot more leptin. Now, in any case, that leptin is going to be released into the blood, and it's going to travel in the blood to the brain um, to a specific nucleus, which is a cluster of cell bodies in the hypothalamus. And this cluster of cell bodies is called the arcuate nucleus. Okay? Now, if you've taken any kind of anatomy or physiology course or whatnot, you probably have learned at some point that the hypothalamus in addition to controlling a bunch of other important processes, is it responsible for the control of hunger. So whether or not you're hungry depends on your level of satiety. So satiety is, by definition, is the feeling of fullness, okay? That you theoretically should get after eating, let's say, a big steak dinner, okay? And so what leptin does is it travels here in the blood to the arcuate nucleus, and it'll signal in a very similar manner to what we just saw in the previous slide, and if you have a lot of leptin, then the arcuate nucleus is going to sense that, and it's going to theoretically say, we've got a lot of leptin, we don't need to be eating. Okay, And so the amount of leptin actually is going to control how hungry you are. So theoretically, if everything's working properly, if you have a lot of leptin, such as all this over here, binding to the arcuate nucleus, then the arcuate nucleus is going to say, we've got a lot of leptin, I don't need to eat. So it's going to theoretically give you a higher degree of satiety. If you have a lower degree of leptin, it might have a, a less profound uh, feeling of satiety. Okay, So you may be actually a little bit hungrier than theoretically this guy on the right should be. Okay, And so it's, it's a graded response depending on how much leptin that's available. Okay, Now obviously we know that there are a lot of other psychological factors at play here and this does not always work. But in theory this is actually how the signaling pathway works. Okay, The more leptin you have binding to the arcuate nucleus, the more satiety should be produced and the less hungry you are. If you have low leptin binding to the arcuate nucleus, then it's going to trigger less satiety and perhaps more hunger. Okay. Now, the other thing that uh, the leptin will also do is it will also, uh, via the hypothalamus, it will trigger the sympathetic neuron to actually um, act on the adipose cells. Okay, So you see here we have the arcuate nucleus. It's going to trigger sympathetic activity on the adipose cells. That's what we're going to look at on this slide. So I've blown this up a little bit so you can see it. And here you have a beta-3 adrenergic receptor, okay? So you have here the sympathetic nerve. Sympathetic nerves release norepinephrine, and that activates the beta-3 adrenergic receptor, okay? Um, and these receptors are present on the membranes of adipocytes, okay? And so whenever you have a lot of leptin present, the arcuate nucleus is going to trigger the sympathetic nerve to release a lot of norepinephrine, which is going to activate this receptor. And when that occurs, you get a host of biosignaling events. But in general, that leads to an increase in the concentration of the second messenger cyclic AMP. 
which then activates protein kinase A. And when you have activated protein kinase A, this leads to a bunch of different processes. The first thing that really happens, the first thing that has to happen is protein kinase A initiates a phosphorylation cascade, which leads to the increased expression of the UCP gene, especially UCP1. UCP1 encodes a protein called thermogenin, although some sources, including this one, will actually call it uncoupling protein, which is actually where the gene name comes from. That uncoupling protein will have to move into the mitochondria, where it will just sit in the membrane, basically alongside the proteins of the electron transport chain. We'll come back to that in a minute. Also recall that in adipose cells, remember that um, leptin is going to stimulate uh, beta oxidation. Okay, so you've got this lipid droplet that's shown in the bottom left corner of this image. Triglycerides are going to be hydrolyzed inside the adipocyte to release fatty acids, which will then be taken up into the mitochondria. And recall that in the mitochondrial matrix, this is where beta oxidation is going to occur. Now, this process of beta oxidation obviously gets rid of the fatty acids. So the more beta oxidation you have and the more fatty acid released from the adipocyte, the smaller the adipocyte should, should become because it's going to shrink because it's going to have less triglycerides because they're being broken down. Now here's the difference. Normally in beta oxidation for really any other cell type, um, and even this cell type under different conditions, the beta oxidation produces NADH and FADH2, which we know are reduced cofactors that will actually power energy production by the electron transport chain. Instead of using it for energy production, instead, um, the NADH and FADH2 still power those proteins in the electron transport chain, but the energy, rather, is dissipated as heat. Um, and that's because all the, the protons that have been pumped by those proteins in the electron transport chain, the proton gradient becomes uncoupled by the uncoupling protein. And instead of getting ATP production, you actually just get energy dissipated as heat. And so uncoupling protein provides a really efficient way of rapidly burning those fatty acids. Um, and the byproduct is just going to be heat here. And if you're still confused on the mechanism of the uncoupling protein, I have a video on that on my channel. I'll try to remember to provide a link to that video in the description of this video. Now, the only other thing I wanted to talk about is that in many cases, the leptin molecule actually fails to function properly. Okay? Um, in some cases, that's just due to a leptin mutation. Um, that can happen. That's not what I'm going to talk about here. What I'm going to talk about is actually generalized inflammation. And this inflammation is going to be more common in obese individuals because generally to get that level of obesity, that person has to be eating foods that are generally pretty high in sugar. Um, actually, sugar will actually make you gain fat a lot quicker than eating fat or protein. Um, even though we, we call it fat, um, that nutrient, sugar will actually make you gain weight as fat much more quickly. And that has to do with sugar's effect on insulin. But sugar also has another effect um, in that when it's consumed in very large quantities, it's actually highly inflammatory. Okay, so a lot of times inflammation ensues in obese individuals. Um, it doesn't have to be an obese individual, but inflammation downregulates and causes issues with the leptin receptor. Okay, and so if you have a, a lower degree of the leptin receptor, then at a given leptin concentration, leptin is going to have problems signaling because there's less of this leptin receptor. And all of the biological effects we just discussed are dependent on leptin being able to bind to that receptor. Um, even on the membrane of the arcuate nucleus. And so with less leptin receptor, there's less leptin function, and it's going to decrease the rate of metabolism at the same concentration of leptin. So you'll have a lower degree of metabolism, lower metabolic rate. You'll have a lower degree of beta oxidation, a higher degree of fat synthesis, and then the other problem is you actually have less satiety and more hunger at the same concentration of leptin, and that's because leptin is failing to signal because of inflammation uh, damaging the uh, ability of the cell to generate the leptin receptor. And that's a problem in Western society that we typically call leptin resistance. Okay? And it's actually closely related to insulin resistance. 
All right, so hopefully this video gave you a good sense of leptin, the leptin receptor, and its important biological functions. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.